Hey, everybody, it is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with David. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. (laughs) And for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? I'm David McCarter. I live in San Diego. I've lived here ever since I was 19 years old. Um, I've been uh, an MVP for 17 years now. I have my own website. That's been around one way or the other since 94 called donettips.com. Uh, I write many books and uh, I go all over the world speaking. And I even host my own show called uh, Rock in the Code World with Donette Dave uh, that we do twice a, twice a month now that's uh, uh, run out of uh, India. And, uh, and that show is super popular. Season three ended uh, in th- at the end of september and we had close to a quarter million people watch wow uh one wow. season yeah yeah the season before was pretty much the same way and i had one i had i was really happy i had one episode uh this year uh my guest was carl franklin who everybody knows pretty much in in my world and uh had, we had over forty thousand people watch that single episode wow yeah and uh so i'm really proud of the show and how it's going and and uh, I have just amazing guests on my show, and I, I love doing it. it. It gets me, you know, talking to experts every, you know, Saturday mornings. That's, you know, we host it uh, twice a month now on Saturday mornings. Yeah, I, that, I often tell people, too, with, with uh, my podcast and the interviews that I do, it's, it's fantastic to, one, I mean, help spread folks that maybe don't know you that are interested mm-hmm. in that space. If, opens up the doors to any new people coming through, but just hearing the, the, uh, the life stories and the work experiences. I mean, I just, it's one of my favorite things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's what the, you know, the show, I, you know, when I was approached to do the show, uh, by C sharp corner, you know, I, because, because of the way I am, I like to do things different. I like to do something that somebody else isn't doing. Right. I, I, I don't want to do the same kind of show that everybody else is doing that, that to me doesn't get a lot of traction. And so I decided to do more of just an interview show, right? We, we don't, we rarely show code, right? It's just me and my guests talking about uh, whatever they're passionate about. So I, I encourage guests. I mean, sometimes I do have topics, especially if I do a panel show, but I really encourage the guests to come on and talk about whatever they're currently passionate about. And let's talk about that. It's a little different, of course, when I talk to, you know, PMs at Microsoft and things like that, they have their agenda. Uh, but usually, but usually it's, it's just talking and we usually have a great time. Sometimes, you know, the show goes off on a tangent, especially if the other person's a musician like me, you know, then we definitely end up talking about music. And so sometimes we do go off the, but that's okay, you know, because, I, I want to have people, you know, know that, you know, there's more to life than coding, right? And and so I try to bring those things into, you know, the show. Like the the get the question I um, uh, ask all my guests the first time they're on the show is, "What do you do for fun?" Right? And because I want to, you know, t- tell coders, especially the younger ones who might be coding a lot and, you know, not doing the fun stuff in their life, you know, that, you know, there's a balance we need to do and, and you need to have fun and work at the same time. And, and for me, my fun also improves my coding, right? Because to me playing music, uh, anything creative helps coding. Yeah. Right. Especially when you're architecting applications, I think, you know, you need to have a, a, a very creative mind to create applications. And so, those kind of things um, all add up. One of the best questions I was asked in India once, uh, this uh, young woman stood up. She was very brave, you know, because women usually in India don't speak up very much. She's very brave and she had, you know, she had a piece of paper with a question. She goes, Dave, you know, you're a, you know, you're a, a award-winning developer, you're an award-winning photographer, you know, you play, you play music, you work for rock bands. 
you know, how do you find time to do all that? You know, right. And, and, you know, my answer basically boiled down to, well, all those other things helps my coding to me, hmm. right? All of that all helps my coding and my coding helps the other things, right? It's to me, it's a, a loop. Well, right? there, there's something too around, um, you know, there's data that shows that when you move away from, you're trying to solve a problem, you get stuck mm -hmm. or, you know, and you're just, you find yourself repeating yourself, kind of retracing the same mistakes in that going and doing something completely different. So something artistic for me, yeah. I mean, it's like reading and I'm a huge sci-fi and fantasy. I'm a Tolkien CS Lewis you know, yeah. guy. And uh, to go and read some of that or play a game, or whatever. And then suddenly like a pause and it mm -hmm. like hit me just something where, uh, you know, it, you think too hard about something. You're not going to solve it. Once you kind of let go, mm -hmm. um, you're able to go back and, or, or approach it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I even had a, I, I had a role once when I was in charge of a, 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 a software team that, you know, if, if any of the members of my team got stuck on something for 20 minutes, I told them stop. Right. And come talk to me, you know, cause not only I might know the answer, but I'm trying to get them away from the screen for a little bit to, because it, you're totally right. You, sometimes you walk away, go make dinner, uh take a shower and it, the thing pops in your head right away just mm -hmm. to get away from it right so yeah well so what so what do you so uh, for folks that don't know what you're writing about like what are your books about what are you writing about what do you what have you been working on so i know we well, were talking just before we started you've got right. something on the verge of being completed right so right now i'm maintaining three books that i keep updating um one is called uh rock your career surviving the technical interview that's all about getting through the technical part of the interview process, because, and you know, to me, if you can't get through that, you're not getting the job, right? And and that book actually comes out from uh, I I wrote that book because it came from my frustration uh, working at a company here in San Diego, and we were mandated to hire beginners only because you know they wanted more butts and seats than you know you know so. Uh, that was a really difficult thing. And, uh, and I just saw all these people mostly, you know, straight out of college, you know, just totally flubbed the technical interview. They weren't prepared. You know, they, they thought they'd just come, come in and, and wing it. And that doesn't work, you know, in most cases. And, and so the, actually the conference talk came first and the conference talk was so popular. Then, then I did the book. Um, uh, the book I've been maintaining since 2005, which I'm going to come, hopefully get out a new version uh, this month, is my uh, uh, Rock Your Code Coding Standards for Microsoft.net. And um, that's been a project of mine ever since 2005 to do consolidated coding standards in one place um, that we used to have before .NET, but we, we didn't really have anymore. And so the book, um, the book kind of is uh, for that. Um, the next book, the other book I'm maintaining, which I'll hopefully get a new version out um, early next year, is called uh, Rock Your Code, Code and App Performance for Microsoft.net. And that comes from a, a lot of work I've been doing in the last, um, uh, I would say close to 10 years, all revolves around performance. And, and especially in today's world with the cloud, you really have to worry about, I mean, Performance was always a thing that we should worry about. And I've brought it up many times when I've been in teams, but now in the cloud, and since you get most of the, most of the charge you get in the cloud is from execution time, right? And so if you can shave off even milliseconds of something you do thousands of times a day, or maybe millions of times a day, it really dramatically can, you know, lower your cloud costs. And so. Well, you think of that too, it, it, a lot of, and there was a movement I know with uh, as mobile usage started increasing in smartphones, and, you know, companies realizing that, you know, Hey, we're, we're seeing more and more of our users. I mean, you know, like I, I've been writing on my blog for almost 20 years and like 60 plus percent of them are mobile readers. Mm-hmm. And I've got a dismal mobile reading experience. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm in the process of fixing it actually this month. But, yeah. uh, but so that's something where a, a lot of application providers realized, hey, we need to do more here. I mean, even look at how Trim 
Windows has become over the last couple of yeah. releases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even Windows is a lot better. Like I even have a Mac. And, uh, you know, my feeling the last couple of years is is Windows is so much better than a Mac now. You know, it, it used to kind of be the other way for me because, you know, the Mac OS was really great. The apps were really great. But um, it's it, to me, it's and and installing things were easier and, and things like that. But now it's the complete opposite. To me, the Mac is harder. You know, the updates mess everything up every time they do a major update. I I will say that Vista ran beautifully on my wife's Mac. Yeah, <laughs> with all the hardware problems. But that was was that the was that the height of bloated? I think it was. That was I pretty know. much Vista. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was it ran uh, uh, error error free on on my wife's Mac, and yeah. and uh, so I was like, what are people complaining about? Vista experience is fantastic, but on that hardware. So so talking about performance, the one thing I want to bring up real quick is. Uh, I have a, uh, somebody I mentored when I worked at um, Verizon and uh, she had a friend uh, who I, I think he just got out of college or something like that, worked for Facebook. His first job at Facebook, he's making 250,000 a year. And I said, what the heck? What is, what is he doing? You know, it, how do you get that much money straight out of college? Number one, I think it's too much money for somebody that young. Uh, and number two, how do you make that much money? And I found out it was because he was doing performance and in Facebook and he was working on performance and, and uh, Facebook and Facebook basically uh, uh, believes that, you know, if we pay this guy 250,000, but he saves us millions of dollars a year, it's totally worth it. Yeah. Right. And so they actually hire people just specifically for performance to get that cost, to get the performance execution time down. So they pay less in yeah. the cloud. Right. And so it's so performance is, is a big deal. You know, the, not only do we have to worry about the users, right, because users will get bored and go to the next Web page. Uh, but now we have to worry about costs in the cloud. Yeah. And, and because someday, you know, I, I think someday, I'm not sure when it will happen, but everything will be in the cloud. You know, we won't host servers at all anymore. I mean, some people will, uh, but I think most everything is going to move to the cloud in the near future. Yeah, there was a, I just had a conversation with Jeff Teepers, the president of collaborative apps and, and, and platforms at Microsoft now, and I'm the, the father of SharePoint. And uh, mm -hmm. he was at this conference over in Amsterdam, the ESPC event, and talking about how um, he felt that it wasn't until he said he thought it was 2017 was the date when he felt like the majority of people that he started speaking to were now embracing the cloud or mm. recognizing that. Now that's now, uh, you know if you look at the number of systems, I mean, still there's a huge on-prem install base, and there's still yeah. net new being installed in there. But I think you're right. At some point, I mean, it's just not going to make sense. Yeah. Um, to, to do that at all, especially with all the tools, especially with the AI, everything else mm -hmm. that we're now requiring of our systems, you can't do that without the scale of the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, I do want to, everybody listening, because I've run into this with a couple of companies, including Verizon, um, that some companies believe that if you just put a VM in the cloud, that's the cloud. And to me, that is not the cloud. That's just co-location, basically, like we yeah. you know we've had for a very, very long time, right? That's not the cloud. And I worked at a company last year. They were they were in a, they were working on a three-year project to move their their apps from .NET Framework to .NET Core and into the cloud in just VMs. And it you know it, it was the tail end of a three-year project, but they were just going to VMs. And I'm it, I was saying this is not the cloud. Because the cloud is using the services that the cloud offers. And that's where you get the huge benefits, and especially if we're talking about performance. That's huge benefits. And for an example, I, I was hired for a company just uh, north of me a little, a little like 20 minutes. And they had a problem because uh, they were trying to onboard sports teams. And unfortunately, their mobile app was sending 600K payloads to their backend system. And that was taking anywhere from seven to 70 seconds to get into the backend system. And so they were trying to onboard the Houston Astros and the Houston Astros said, that's way too slow. 
we're not we're not going to do it unless you get the because the Houston Astros wanted to do batting practice, walk to the team room and have everything analyzed by then. And that wasn't happening when it takes it takes 70 seconds to ingest one swing, right, of the bat. Yeah. And so um using I didn't change so the 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 solution that I came up with was I didn't change any of the code that processed this data. All I did was stand up the cloud in front of it by, you know, uh, putting the message, you know, into a queue and then have events fire and process the messages as fast as it came in. Right. And so I got that seven, when I left, uh, we were in testing to go live and uh, I got that seven to 70 second processing down to 200 milliseconds or less. Wow. Right. And that to me is the power of the cloud, not virtual machines, right? right? That's where you get the performance is when you start using more of a disconnected way of, of doing things, right? Instead of a big monolithic way. And, uh, and that pros, you know, that, it, you know, creates challenges too, of course, but, uh, but for, if you were just talking about performance, it's just hugely yeah. Huge difference. Yeah, I, I'm interested in your answer to this because like, I know with the the mentoring and the stuff that you that you do, I, I used to advise, and I've done, I've, I've spoken at a couple uh, you know, community colleges and universities, and uh, you know somebody who like I, I have marketing degrees, but I've been for over 30 years. I've been in IT, I've been in technical management roles. I was at Pacific Bell for mm. for a long time, and then uh, you know a number of other startups. Uh, and and I would talk about software configuration management and DevOps and mm -hmm. you know code management. Like these are roles which, you know, people that are in computer science programs uh, are, are you know data platform programs. They're not excited. They're not sexy jobs or sounding to college no. students. But that's something where you go in. You can have you know college years part time experience, but say, hey, I've been in this space for a year or two and you can make maybe not Facebook crazy money, but you can make really good money, you know, uh, you know, 140, 160 K a year doing yeah. that stuff, you know, for with one or two years out of college. Mm -hmm. And, and I saw, I'd tell people this and there's always shortages of these, of those kinds of roles, DevOps roles, is, especially what do you advise? And people say like, well, what, what to go look into? Like, here's an example. I've got a, a son that graduated from university of Utah with his degree in atmospheric sciences, I kept telling him because he was capable of doing it, like do a computer science uh, uh, minor. And his senior year, he's like, dad, and he didn't do it. He's like, he thought he'd be too busy. His senior year, he's just like, I should have done that because he mm -hmm. got into data science, learned Python and R, mm -hmm. loved it, is doing that in his day-to-day -day job now. I keep telling him, get out of government. You can double your salary by getting- Oh yeah, get out of government, you know, work like, in government. <laughs> but but he wants to work for NASA. He wants to go oh, do all that yeah. stuff. So yeah. so anyway, um, but those those kinds of opportunities. What do you advise people? Like where where do you see like the the underserved areas are where there's opportunities for people that are coming out of college that sh they should be looking at? Well, you're right. It you know the DevOps is is a role that you know I think more companies need to have. You know, unfortunately, at least in my book, I think too many companies are having the, you know, the developers do DevOps, which I think is a mistake, huge mistake. Um, I think that should be, should be a completely separate role, just like, for example, database, you know, uh, administrators and, and designers are completely Q, separate. Q&A. Yeah. 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 And, QA. And, and QA and everything. So yeah. um, I see a huge, if, if you look at the roles that i find uh i have a hard time finding really good people devops is one database is another one and to me if if you're really good at either one of those you can make good money doing those two um the the other thing i've been recommending since the 90s basically is you know one of the pro problem people have and when i taught at the i taught at the university here for 18 years and you know, a lot of students will come up to me and say, OK, well, now I've taken the course, you know, that that you run and we got the certificate that I was, you know, uh, on the board of. And and what how do I get a job? And I go, well, the problem is you need experience. Right? It's a whole chicken and the egg thing. And so 
One of the things I recommend uh, people who want to get a software engineering job is to pick a job similar to it, right? Work there, you know, prove you're good at that and then start moving into what you really want to do, right? And so back in the 90s, I, because I saw people do this uh, successfully, actually, I recommended people go into QA, yeah. right? Because yeah. That's kind of like the first thing you learn a lot about the application and the, and, and how it works and, and the, the features patterns and the, of mistakes that are being made, what people right. are doing wrong. Right. Yeah. Right. And so go into QA first and yeah, most people QA is not sexy, right? It's, right. it's, it's, it's something a lot of people don't really want to do, but it's a really good place to get your feet wet and and the story I used to tell at the university is is of this young woman who was at this company that I used to work at just up the street. And that's exactly what she did. She got a job in QA. She was really good at that job. And then she slowly started coming over to us, in the programming department, asking for small little things to do. Right. And and we gave them to her and she was really good at it. And then we hired her. We yeah. hired her straight out of QA into the our programming department and uh so that's a really i mean if you like devops you can stay there but you know i think doing those jobs that may not necessarily be a software engineering job gets you into the company especially if it's a large company like uh I'm, i won't use a nasa example but maybe like uh you know i worked at verizon for two and a half years once and maybe that's a good way to get into verizon is to start doing something else yeah. Than software engineering job because that because then you can start getting experience you know that way well and i was i i served for many years first half of my career first 15 years were in pro, uh, project and program management roles mm -hmm. and if you're coming over with again a couple years of devops uh and or s debt experience you know test experience qa roles um over into project management to have that technical mm -hmm. knowledge the best PMs always had that technical start. Oh, yes. Again, I was a marketing guy. I, I had different skill set, but the ones that did the best and moved up quickly mm -hmm. uh, on the management side were those that had just even a couple of years and had that, mm -hmm. that technical undergrad. So there's a lot, there's yeah. a lot of opportunities. If you go in and you get in to find that, you know, just coding is not your passion. There are other paths with yeah. that skill set too. And, you know, I'd like to point out again that, you know, if you do go into something like DevOps or QA or databases and you really like it and you're really good at it, to me, you can write your own ticket because those roles and, and project managers too, those roles to me are the hardest to find really good people, yeah. right? That really know what they're doing. And when I do find somebody in any of those positions that are really good, I keep in contact with them to try to bring them into another job I'm on and things like that, because they're so hard to find. There's lots of software engineers, you know, not everybody's great, but but finding really great people in those other roles is is to me is pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 because it, I think it's more of a minority kind of role as if you compare it to software engineers, then like I said, you can write your ticket. You know, you you can demand more money because there's less of you, right? Right. Yep. That's, I think that's actually part of the problem with software engineering right now is there's too there's too many people, you know that uh, you know I know people get into it because they they heard they can make lots of money and things like that, but. Right now, it's just to me, it's oversaturated, and it's it's really tough, you know, to get through that, you know, and and to show, to show why you somebody should hire you because there's so we're we're competing against people all over the world now. We used to yeah. compete just with people locally, right? But well, now we're competing all over the world. And I mean, that, this, David, this, we're we're venturing in like a whole, we could talk for an hour on that topic. <laughs> and I know with you, like you're interviewing, so maybe we should schedule and do a collab talk podcast, a regular full length, because that's something, again, going back and talking with students groups. And I mean, I've, I've got four adult children. I've get, I gave them, a, like I outlined, here's what you need to be doing uh, to stand out while you're still in your undergrad. This right. is what you can be doing. It's more work, but you will stand out. And uh, unfortunately, none of my kids listened. 
Yeah. <laughs> and, well, kids and never listen, listen to their parents. Of right? course. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't. Old, <laughs> yeah, my uh, my oldest, who's also in the data science side of things, who did listen and kind of got out of the academia um, government side and went uh, and is doing very well over and again a data science uh, person uh, in the healthcare industry. But she listened and she's now late. She's now starting to write and build her social profile around mm-hmm. a lot of that and great content. And so it's, it's great to see, but I just like, like, see, you could have been doing, you could have d- done this, started down this path 10 years ago, and you would be further ahead than you are today. Yeah. And, and you bring up another subject that's important about um, getting your name out there. Right. And, and there's, there's lots of ways to do that. I mean, that's one of the reasons I write books, you know, I, I have a blog, you know, since 1994, you know, I, I speak a lot, you know, I used to teach, teach in university, you know, I did a lot of things, especially in my beginner years, because I start, I, you know, I founded and started running a user group the first year I was a software developer. Yeah. Right. And, and that, you know, and I've written all about this and I've talked about it a lot, but that single thing dramatically improved my uh, software engineering life and my personal life. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I, I did a talk when I hit 25 years on just how much speaking has, has dramatically changed yeah. my life. Yeah. And, 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 but part of that is writing and things like that too. Right. And getting your name out there. And, and when I, when I mentor young people, I tell them the same thing. You need to start writing on blogs. If you want to write on my blog, fine. I will be happy to host you. Uh, but you really need to start getting your name out there somehow. It, C- you know. Completely agree. I, I saw a similar path that started writing, selling articles in the late 90s. Um, mm-hmm. co-founded a 501c3, a nonprofit around user groups in 2002 mm-hmm. in Northern California. Like, it, so I'm a big advocate for writing, sharing your knowledge, getting involved in the local yes. regional community, yes. getting on the speaking circuit, um, you know, all these things. Anybody could go do that. It's, uh, you know, we are our, our own uh, uh, you know, biggest roadblocks to, yes. to doing yes, these are. things. There's plenty of people there. There are people that would surprise you out there that are listening, watching this, um, that are big names that still feel like throwing up before they go out on mm-hmm. stage. They're so nervous. You know, oh, I was that. in the beginning. I was definitely like that. I'm not, a, I don't get nervous anymore, but in the beginning, I what? did not want to speak. <laughs> this is another thing we should talk about. Cause also I was a musician. I sang in, an, a, in a rock band for mm-hmm. years. I always tell people, I don't get nervous on stage because we did all originals. I was the lead singer. Like you kind of burn that out of your system. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So this reminds me of, uh, I just published an article on DonnetTips.com today about the importance of attending in-person conferences now that they're back, you know, after COVID because, and I wrote that article because before I went to uh, uh, Lithuania to speak at Build Stuff, you know, I started hearing about the low attendance at conferences. And so I spent a bunch of time, including when I was in Lithuania, trying to, to think about that going, okay, why is that, right? And so I did a Twitter poll asking people, why aren't you going to conferences, right? Because to me, I started going to conferences the first year I was a software engineer, right? Yeah. And and that dramatically changed my 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 career too, is by going to conferences. And, uh, and the number one uh, answer in the poll was the company won't let them. And so I, I you know, in the article, I'd say why I, what I get out of going to conferences, but then I also tackle the four, the four issues that I asked in the poll and that why aren't people going? And I feel that uh, because of, you know, the company's not letting developers go, the younger developers aren't getting exposed to this and they're not understanding, you know, the value of going to in-person as opposed to watching a video. Yeah. Right. Well, definitely. I'm going to go grab that link. I'll have to find that article because I wrote a similar post a week ago, coming back from Amsterdam, mm-hmm. wrote something similar saying like, hey, the it's not about like the content is the easiest part. You can go find the content, you right. can follow it with the speakers. You don't have to attend and you can enrich yourself that way. It's you can't 
uh, replace the the face to face the interactions mm-hmm. the the serendipity of walking through the conference hall finding like one of your favorite authors or speakers having a conversation yes. making a connection like it's the networking it's huge yes I, it is. I tell people all the time that most of the time when i go to conferences i don't even go to sessions i spend most of the time i'm either speaking or i'm networking or yep. i'm resting right <laughs> Right. Yep. And 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 it be, I rarely go to sessions, especially since they're all mo- most everything is on video now. I can watch it later. Right. Yep. But the the personal interaction now that's different, you know, depending on the conference and the location. For example, you know, when I speak in India, I'm inundated with people. They they won't leave me alone. <laughs> you know? right. Sometimes I have to go hide my room just to get away from it for a little bit. And in contrast, you know, when I spoke in Lithuania, it was the complete opposite. I had a really hard time getting people uh, to network there. And even yeah. though the, you know, the conference had networking lunches and things, people just weren't just culturally different. Yeah, culturally yeah. Different. that was like like my first conference speaking in Germany, like no, no questions. Yeah. I, mean, I, just, I thought I did poorly. <laughs> and then I had one of the top scoring sessions for the conference. I'm like, Are you, what? Yeah. <laughs> no one came and talked to me at all, but people loved the content. It's but, definitely uh, a culture yeah. thing. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, Dave, I really appreciate your time. Of course, I've got all the links. Um, so yeah. I'll have it. You can find it out in uh, the YouTube. You can find it out on buckthepilot.com and the blog. Be able to have all this out there. So thanks so much for your time. And I will, I'll, let's reach out. Let's connect. I would love to get in to talk about this side, about uh, the, the, the finding a job conversation. Yeah. I would love to, to have that with you. Yeah, and I'd like to talk about why I like being an MVP too. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, to me also, you know, being a Microsoft MVP has really, really helped a lot, you know, uh, mostly by networking, right? Yeah. You know, uh, like my producer for my show goes, how, how do you get all these people on, how do you get all these important people on your show? And I go, well, number one, I just ask. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah. the hardest thing to do for mo- a lot of people. But number two, I've spent at least 17 years now networking with Microsoft people and I can reach anybody at Microsoft. I've even reached uh, uh, um, Guthrie. Yeah. I, I was at a company and I asked them, why aren't you looking at Azure? And, and the lead developer said, because Microsoft's not getting, giving us any love. And I go, oh, I'll fix that. I emailed Scott Guthrie. The next day, we had two managers from Microsoft on the phone with her. Yeah, right. And that's the power of the MVP that yeah. I really, really, really do like. I, and I'm I'm also an RD, and I'd say that I've witnessed that as through the MVP and RD networks, that exact same thing too. So, and that's advice for anybody if you're you're struggling with uh, with legitimate you know issue or concerns with Microsoft. I mean, that's one of the things that the MVPs and RDs can provide. So definitely, mm-hmm. if you know one, have one yes. in your network, reach out. Yeah. yeah, but that's what I feel that's part of my job. I always yeah. felt that, you know, I'm kind of like the first line of defense between the the regular developers of Microsoft, right? Yeah. Because I've I've gone to a level where I can talk to both sides. Yeah. So I every time I went to Microsoft, for the MVP summit, I always felt it was my job to bring, you know, the issues that local developers are experiencing to Microsoft yeah, and to make things better. Right. I, That's always- I do that. I always feel like I'm selfish. I'm like, here are my customers issues and <laughs> I and I do that, but no, that's, that, that's what they love. That's what they want you to do. Yes. Well, yeah. They love it. Not all. It depends on what, what it is, but yeah. yeah. But people just need to reach out. That's, that's, right. You, you don't be afraid to ask. You might get rejected. That's okay. Uh, but you're not going to get anywhere if you don't ask. Right. Right. Well, Dave, really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>